greatest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. so true. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am who I am. I am who you say I am. Great and wonderful song. Good evening to all that is out there. It is good to know that we have some folks out there on this fine evening. Little uh, wet today, a little cooler today, but still in all a lovely day. Pray that you have had a good day and that God has blessed you abundantly and you've been able to be uh, in the midst of his service as he uh, works through your life. We're going to jump right in and uh, get started uh, with this evening, cover a little bit of ground, have a, a new video for you that has come out of just uh, the last convention that uh, the SBC had back in June down in, in Anaheim. So i uh, got kind of a, a special look at that as it talks about an event that happens every year at the convention within whatever city the convention is being held. It's called the Crossover Event. And this, of course, was then Crossover Anaheim. I'm going to give you a little information about that. Uh, Josh worked those events uh, several years ago, right out of high school. He went down as a, uh, uh, a, a, a two-week mission trip under the auspice of the Home Mission Board Evangelism Section to work with Crossover San Diego when it was held down there. But at any rate, uh, we're looking at the bread that came down from heaven. We concluded the uh, the healing waters there at Mara. The next encounter, of course, we have with the people and their attitude and grumbling comes when uh, they get out there and they find that they're just a little bit hungry. And uh, like us, when they got hungry, they begin to grumble. 
they like us gripe if we might even think we'll miss uh, a single meal, especially if we've got our mouth set, you know, for something. Uh, interesting, uh, last night we uh, had a young couple that, uh, that we had in our, our very first church, John and his brother James, his twin brother, were members of our youth group, part of Sherry's uh, uh, puppet ministry. Their dad was uh, uh, one of my deacons. Their mom, just a great, great uh, Christian lady. We loved them a lot, Jan and Gerald Heron, and their two boys, James and, and John. Well, uh, Johnny went off to go to uh, Golden Gate University along with his high school sweetheart, and they ended up praying for my sister, Miss Terry. says, good evening, Miss Terry, uh, for my sister and my dad. Dad has a lot of new issues going on, and the latest is COVID. God love him. You bet we will, Terry. But at any rate, uh, uh, Johnny and Debbie went off to Grand Canyon University, and uh, got involved with churches down there, youth directory leading uh, work down there. They end up, you know, getting married. I had the privilege 38 years ago of uh, officiating at their wedding. And if I get that here, let's see if I can, uh, I think this is them. Uh, There it is. That's John and Debbie Heron. Uh, They're up here again, traveling through on business and and a vacation. Just the greatest, great voice, uh, uh, took a lot of training and uh, did a lot of work, but, uh, you know, just a great, great young man. And uh, they came by and they called us and said, we're going to be in town, can we have dinner? So we went and had dinner together and, and just had the greatest time. God was just blessed us in a real wonderful, wonderful way to see this young couple at home. Young to us, I guess. We buried them, so, uh, but just a joy. We set out the meal, and uh, I saw something in the menu I hadn't had for a while. I thought about it, and I loved jambalaya, so I ordered it, and boy, did it taste good. You know, did it ever hit the spot, you see? When you got your mouth set for a meal, and then maybe when it's yanked away from you, you know, you get a little bit of grumbly going on. Well, here in Exodus 16, and verse 2, we read that the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled there in the wilderness because, uh, hey, you brought us out here. We're going to starve to death. Two million people grumbling at Moses and Aaron because they were afraid they were going to miss a meal. Now, listen, folks, grumbling is very serious business and has dire consequences. Uh, it's found eight times, that very word, from verses 8 through verse 12. Moses makes a profound statement to the people of Israel that applies to us as well and calls our attention to this matter of grumbling. Oh, let me put that back up here. Or up there. He says, Moses said, this will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, talk about you know, manna, and bread to, uh, to the full in the morning. For the Lord hears your grumbling which you grumble against him. And what are we? Your grumblings are not against us, but against the Lord. I want you to note who their grumbling ultimately was against. And and apply it back to us when we find ourselves grouching and grumbling about the state or the condition of, of, uh, of, of our world or our life, our circumstance, whatever it is. And we find ourselves grumbling. And, and we do. I mean, that's part of the human condition. We're going to find ourselves there. When we do, we need to pull ourselves up and, uh, and and move ourselves away. Sherry and I, you know, we get irritated with each other when we do it sometimes. But we, we try to, to hold each other accountable. And uh, she's got a harder job at that than I do. But, uh, you know, because grumbling really is not against the circumstance of the situation, but the one who is sovereign behind them all. Your grumbling is not against us. It's against the Lord. Uh, we're going to discuss this a little bit more in a moment as we, we move on. But I want to say, you know, God ends up then preparing them or, or providing for them manna. Uh, and, and in verse 4, that 16th chapter, it says that the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people will go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. 
Now, on the Sabbath, the, the day before the Sabbath, they could gather up two days' work since they weren't supposed to, to go out and labor and do that kind of stuff on the Sabbath. You know, so they could gather up two days, and it would stay fresh. But if, if if it were a weekday and they gathered up one uh, you know two days worth, well half of it would be spoiled the next morning. We worm ridden, all right. So Moses didn't provide the manna for the people. God did, and the Lord provided meat at night uh, in the form of quail and manna in the morning uh, for the next forty years until they crossed over and into the Jordan. I mentioned just a moment ago a uh, the mission video. I did manage to dig out a new one not seen before by by us at least, and uh, brought it forward for this evening. And it has to do with uh, with the uh, the event called crossover uh, that happens during the convention. And in this particular one, it was crossover Anaheim. So let me go ahead and bring that in for you. <laughs> that back that's the wrong one let's see if I got it out here where is it what I do with it uh, well you know how frustrating that can be sometimes when you have everything set up and you're ready to go and it just doesn't play fair you know for you Glad to be joining in, even if I am a bit late. I'm glad you're there too, my dear, my sweet, sweet lady. Okay. Well, I'm going to, we're going to do this because I don't want to miss the mission moment. But for some reason, I can't find where that thing went when I pulled it out. So you're going to have to just bear with me for a moment as we get there. I want to open. All right. I will not be defeated in this endeavor. Thank you. Why take the time to go to another community and play games with children we don't even know? Why do yard work at a home across the state or even across the country? Why gather with others to serve at evangelistic events like Crossover and Serve Tour? God uses opportunities like this to get me out of my comfort zone, um, to, get, to you know, be able to hang out with people and to chat with them um, and just share the love of Jesus with him. Serve Tour means mobilizing compassion to share the gospel. I think it's really powerful when churches in communities are willing to just, just get outside of themselves and love people in the community. It's amazing what, what God can do. This year, Serve Tour and Crossover set the example. And that's why people came, to serve and love the people of Anaheim. Alongside local churches, we were the hands and feet of Christ. The experiences that I had was always about someone else today. It had nothing to do about me, my family, what my needs were, but it was actually coming out, serving the community as the Lord has served us. In a time when disunity threatens the church, people from all over the country come together to share the gospel and to love, restore, evangelize, and revitalize a city. Through Serve Tour, Crossover gathered everyday believers in local churches to serve communities and share the hope of the gospel. This is where God is sending us, and He will use us to love our neighbors for His glory. And that's why playing with kids meant so much, why taking time out of our busy schedules became so important. For just a little while, we experienced what the church would be like if reaching the community, any community, became a priority. It's all about Christ, so that people can see how God works through His people to be a light in the darkness. That gives you an idea of what the crossover events are all about. Uh, they're really kind of neat. Uh, uh, I've only worked in none, as a matter of fact, because I very rarely, in fact, Sherry and I haven't been to the convention since the mid-80s uh, that way. But uh, 
Uh, I do know what the experience is like because we did some of that kind of thing here when we did the uh, 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 Church Growth and Evangelism Conference here that we put together for the, uh, the association. But at any rate, uh, you know, that gives us an idea of the kind of work that is going on even in a spontaneous way, though it's not really spontaneous because it's planned throughout the year. But still, people sign up and they come. They even sign up when they get to the convention and and uh, move in and become a part of that event. And it's uh, really kind of a neat experience. So Terry has out here to pray for her sister and her dad. Uh, and he has COVID, so there's some other issues at play. Sherry says, we're praying for you guys, uh, for your sister and your dad. Such difficult times to live and work through. Yes, it is. So let's go ahead and... Uh, Spend a few moments in prayer. Father, we come to you and thank you that uh, we can meet and join together on this Wednesday evening. Father, I, I know as summer comes that people, you know, work in the yard and they're out later and sometimes they don't come in and, and get in right on time. They may come in late or, Lord, they may pick it up later or tomorrow morning or uh, whatever. But, Lord, we want this to be a special time. A time when we remember the work that you're doing and the work that you do through us, through missions, and our connection with that as uh, as a people of God, as a as, as a uh, Baptist church, as a Southern Baptist church, we thank you that we can be involved in these sorts of things. I thank you for the joy of renewing relationships with Sherry and I and, and Josh uh, last night as we met with John and Debbie and just had such a great time. Thank you for that, Lord. It was a real gift, and we appreciate it. Now, Lord, uh, Terry has asked us to remember her sister and her dad. Uh, Lord, it's such a difficult time. I, uh, I had the privilege. We were honored by having my brother be mom's caretaker, Lord. But uh, we understand uh, something of what it is to carry that, that responsibility. So we lift Terry's sister up. And she is the uh, uh, the immediate caregiver. She's right there. She's able to take care of those needs. And I know, Lord, that uh, from being the one that was away, the burden that, uh, that Terry feels. So I ask you to lift her up and encourage her and comfort her. We pray for her dad, Lord, who has other issues going on right now. One of them, of course, being uh, COVID. We pray, Lord, that you will protect and sustain him. God, uh, let your hand be at work in the whole situation down there in Texas. We love you, Lord, and we come seeking your wisdom tonight, looking into your word and allowing that word to speak to our hearts. May you be blessed and honored at our time together now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's kind of uh, move on with this idea that is fostered here with the children of Israel in the wilderness. And it begins uh, back there at the bitter waters of Marah. And we see it following them through their entire journey uh, uh, across the wilderness. For, for 40 years, there's not a change in the heart of this generation. And their grumbling really demonstrates an unbelieving heart. It was because of their unbelief that their hearts were hardened and uh, they continually wandered away from God. And it's also our case. That's what happens to us when, uh, when uh, uh, unbelief begins to harden our own heart and we find ourselves drifting away and wandering away from that, that firm foundation or that solid mooring that we have in Christ. In speaking to this about of this generation of Israelites, David writes in the Psalms, in Psalm 95 and verse 10, he says, for 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and have not known my ways. God speaking through David, what a profound statement. For 40 years, they grieved me. I mean, talk about long patience and suffering. You know, the, the long patient suffering of God. For 40 years, they grieved his very heart and, and uh, said that they err in their heart. 
and they've not known my ways for 40 years. Now listen, would you consider all that they saw, everything that they experienced, but still they've not known his ways? The word air there means to wander away. It speaks of one uh, who is away from God, drifted uh, away from God, or just simply wandered out in their own way. Isaiah says, for all we like sheep have gone astray, and each has gone in his own direction. And that's exactly what this word air means. We, we've wandered away. But there's a, a there's almost a deliberate casualness about it. You know, it's like a child who wanders away from uh, from the picnic area and gets lost in the in, in the woods. They don't deliberately go out to get lost. They're just wandering away, daydreaming, whatever it happens to be. Well, the children of Israel were complaining, and the real problem was not because they were without a water or because they were low on food. They were complaining because they were not where the Lord had been, uh, where, where they should have been, you know, with their relationship with God. They ought to be trusting him, shouldn't they? After all, he's, he's parted the Red Sea, he's brought them out from slavery, he dried the land. They crossed on dry land. They watched as their their bitter enemy, the Egyptian army, was defeated as the waters closed in on them. They rejoiced and exalted how great their God was. They went three days and got a little thirsty and began to grumble. And yet God said, I, I was testing them at, at this time. And they failed the test. God gave them sweet water, took them to an oasis, uh, and and provided for them there. They saw the provision of God, yet here they are again in that same state of grumbling. You see, uh, they were complaining because they were, they were not where they should have been in their relationship with God. I don't know about you or, you know, or Maybe me in, in a similar situation. I think if I saw something like that, do you, don't you think that you would uh, would not forget when the next challenge come up that, uh, hey, listen, God met that one, he can meet this one? Well, I don't know. Do we do that in our life today? You know, we get through one challenge or one circumstance or one problem, and uh, we're finally through that, and God's brought us through. We hit the next one, and immediately we find ourselves back worrying and grumbling and complaining or whatever. You see, we're not unlike them, really. Now, God wants us to make that decided, decided act to say, listen, you know, you've done it before, Lord. You're going to do it again. But we don't always do that, do we? Uh, you see, their complaining was merely a symptom of their heart problem, just like when we complain, it's a symptom of ours. The writer to the Hebrew believers in Rome had a, 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 a quick word of exhortation you know, for us as it relates to this group of people. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13, it says, Take care, brethren, that there may that there not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away or wanders away. You know, that, that word is very similar uh, to the word error uh, that we find in the Septuagint. It said, but uh, uh, that you be found in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The writer is calling for actions that are personal and public so the believers don't miss what God has for them. We need one another. He tells the believers, take care. He's calling for every believer to consider the example of the children of Israel. In simple words, he's telling us to learn from their example. He's telling us not to let the same thing happen to us that happened to them. Just don't allow an evil, unbelieving heart to cause us to fall away from the living God. I wonder how many people have distanced themselves from the church or fallen away in their walk with God and, and distanced themselves from all of these simply because of an unbelieving heart. See, it's not only a matter of looking at the example of the children of Israel, but it's also looking into our own hearts to see if there is any attitudes that exist 
in in the heart uh, that existed in the heart of the children of Israel existing in our own heart. This is why the psalmist could say when David writes in Psalms 139 and verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Do we ever really get serious and pray that prayer? Because if we're serious and we pray that prayer, we're, we're, we're asking God to do something incredible. And it's going to hurt. And there's going to be some pain. There's going to be some anguish. There's going to be some disappointment. There's going to be some blush faces, whatever. But he will point out anything that offends him. He will test us. He will search our heart. He'll turn the the light of his, his glory upon our heart. And we'll see the impurities that are there. Remember in 1 John? Where he says in verse 7, if we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The closer we get to the light, the closer we get to the brilliance and radiance of God, the more we see the, our own imperfections and impurities. So take this prayer in Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24, seriously. And God will do some incredible things. And you lay those on his lap, every one that he brings up, and you confess them and lay them aside. Allow him to strip away the layers of callousness that unbelief has brought to the heart. It takes being honest with ourselves. And it takes being honest with God. If we're going to consider the true condition of our heart. He's also telling us to be an encouragement to others as well. In verse 13 of that third chapter of Hebrews, he says, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So he not only places us responsible for ourselves, but he places us in a position of responsibility for our brothers and sisters. Because here God is calling not only for a a personal examination, but also for a public encouragement to guard not only ourselves, but others from this very deceitful thing that we call sin. The word encourage there is the Greek word, is the word we get exhort, it's a Greek word, parakaleo, and, and it is a form of that word that is used of Jesus, uh, when, by Jesus, when he's speaking about the Holy Spirit, when he refers to him as another comforter, another paraclete. Uh, so, you know, one, you know, like me, the word speaks of coming alongside to help. As believers, we're encouraged to come alongside one another for the purpose of support. Now, this must never be a moment when we drop our guard. For the moment we do, our heart can begin to grow hard, which is another reason that we need to encourage one another uh, to stay the course. And we need others to encourage us to stay the course. Now, taking all of these things that we've looked together there, uh, there about uh, the, uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness, you know, grumbling about bread, and what, what the writer of Hebrews, how he applies all of that, we come to the very heart and the core of the image, the, the shadow, the, uh, the, the, the type that is given to us there of manna, and that is that Jesus is the bread of heaven. He's the bread that came down. You see, manna is a type of Christ giving his life that the believer might have eternal life. Jesus Christ is the true manna. He's the bread that came down of heaven. Jesus tells us about this bread uh, that, that, that gives life. It, it, it's not the commodity, but the person who gives life. And it, that begins the moment someone believes on him, and it satisfies them throughout eternity. The manna that came down in the Old Testament satisfied for a season, sustained them for a season until they got into the promised land, uh, that full and rich spiritual life. But 
the manna that we receive when we receive Christ, when we believe in him, will sustain us throughout eternity. It will never fail. It'll never spoil. It'll never go bad. It'll all be sufficient for every day through eternity. The life he gives is eternal because he himself is eternal. This is eternal life, he says, that they know you, uh, the only Father, and, and, and the one whom you have sent, speaking of himself. The person who believes in Jesus is the person that receives eternal life because they receive he who is eternal. He is the giver of life for all who will believe on him. Just as Yahweh provided manna in the wilderness of sin, Jesus is the heavenly provider of the, uh, of the bread of heaven that issues in eternal life. And a person who eats his bread, if you will, will never die. Look with me. Flip over there to John in the sixth chapter and, and, and pick up with a conversation that Jesus is having with the crowd after he fed the 5,000. And we find these words in John 6, starting in verse 29 and going down to verse 36. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. What is the work of God? He fed 5,000 with the loaves of uh, uh, the, 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 the fish and the, and, and the loaves. He said, this is the work of God that you believe in him who sent him. So that he said to them, what then do you do for a sign so that you may see and and they you know and and believe you what work do you perform our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as written he gave them bread to eat bread of heaven to eat so jesus answered them he says to them this is the work of god that you believe in him you've said that's 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 the only work that you need to do. You need to believe. That's it. And then they retort back and say, well, then what sign are you going to give us? Now, I don't know what more they want. I mean, he's just fed thousands of people with a meager lunch. But what sign are you going to do so that we can see it and believe you? Doesn't that sound like people today? Well, you show me a miracle. If God will just part the water again, I'd believe. If I could see, I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. Seeing isn't believing. Truthfully, believing is seeing. Perform for us, will you? What work are you going to perform? Dance for us. Then they give him a good example. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread out of heaven. Then Jesus responds to them, and he says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that, you, that, is that which can, comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Or I, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, but and yet you do not believe. Jesus used a great figure of speech that means to believe in him. Just like they had to appropriate the bread out there in the wilderness, so we have to appropriate the bread that he gives us, and we do so by faith in him. Just like they had to gather it up and receive it, so we need to receive also. Now, Jesus isn't referring to the Lord's Supper here, as some say, or, or the sacraments, as, as, as uh, uh, people have tried to reason. The Lord's Supper wouldn't even be instituted for another year. Jesus surely would have used the symbolism of the Lord's Supper. He wouldn't have done that while speaking to these Jews in, 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 in arguing with them. They wouldn't have been able to understand what he was saying. It wouldn't have made any sense. No, in this situating, eat, situation, eating and drinking is simply, simply symbolism for having faith in him and the provision of her eternal life that he has made for us. 
we eat and drink Jesus by believing in him as our Lord and our Savior. In the context of this text, in verses 29, 35, and I think 40, 47, uh, and I believe 69, Jesus refers to believing on him. Now, that's what's at the core of this conversation. His death gives life to all who will believe on him. The only possible meaning is that the spiritual appropriation of Jesus Christ by faith is what brings nourishment and satisfaction eternally to the soul of man. In John 6, verse 47, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Now, in Galatians 2, at verse 16, and verse 20, the Apostle Paul teaching us is, is incredibly clear on this subject. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but, by, but through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Jesus Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And then he caps all this conversation off with that great word in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. My friend, Jesus is more than manna. He is our sustaining bread of life. We can have all of him that we desire. We could never desire too much of him. We definitely will never be disappointed in him. May the Lord cure us of our spiritual anemia and cause our hearts to feed daily at his table. In this conversation with these people who just simply would not get it, he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate men in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that the one who eats of it and not so so one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down of he, in he, from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread also which I will give for life of this world is my flesh. Now. Let's not go off the deep end like, like some have and said, okay, when we take the Lord's Supper, it becomes the, the physical body of Christ. No, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about cannibalism. I think you understand that. I think you know that. He gives his life for the world, and the, and, and the bread which also I will give for the life of the world is his flesh. Where does he give his flesh? Upon the cross. And Jesus goes on to stress that he came down from the Father in heaven and we can have fellowship with him. In verses 56 and 58, he says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he's talking figuratively, of course, abides in me and I in him. In other words, if you receive me, you'll abide in me and I'll abide in you. John 15. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, who receives me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as your fathers ate and died. He who eats or receives unto themselves, this bread will live forever. You see, Jesus is the very last word in manna. He said in Revelation 2 and verse 17, he says, he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes to him, I will give some hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on it, which no one knows but he who receives it. Don't take that out of context either and build a false doctrine as some have on it as well. Jesus Christ is our bread from heaven. Come he says, let's feast on him and do it daily. That's why I'm loving these daily Bible studies. I so appreciate all of you that are involved in them.
as we sit at the banquet table together. We have life-sustaining fellowship and we, as we abide in him. And he alone gives us grace and strength for each day. Could it be that we are now enjoying the heavenly food that we shall partake of in Christ for all eternity? I pray so. I want, I want to take a moment and just, just share with you just, just some more that deals with the type. Just, just very quickly, just kind of to wrap this up. God has called the manna, as we, as we saw. He, he, he called manna bread, right? Well, and of course, we just saw that Jesus calls himself the bread of life or the living bread. Manna provided the Israelites with a temporal life. Jesus, the living bread, provides all everything you know everything we need for eternal life. He says, I, "I'm the living bread. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever." Manna came down from heaven. Uh, the Lord told Moses, "I will rain bread from heaven." And Jesus, of course, has told us, "He is the bread which comes down from heaven." The Lord gave manna to the children of Israel, and God gave His only begotten Son to all the children of man. There was enough manna for every person, every family and every person in that camp. And the atonement of Jesus Christ, there's enough manna, it's if infinite, sufficient to cover all God's children and every ounce of sin. Every person receives his fill of manna. So they, they gathered every, uh, every man according to his eating. Jesus fills those who are spiritually hungry. He says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. Manna was totally undeserved. The Lord said, I've heard their murmuring, their grumbling, and the children of Israel, and, and even, even they eat of the flesh in the morning, and you uh, will be filled with bread. But yet they grumble. Jesus died for undeserving sinners, people. For when we were yet powerless. At the right time, at the right moment, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The children of Israel ate manna for 40 years and, and in a period of testing, and it stopped. Jesus was tempted by Satan and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and then it stopped. And he satisfies us not for only a time and period, but for all eternity. Concerning those who overcome the world, he said they will be given to eat of the hidden manna. And Jesus, the living bread, is that hidden or unknown to the wicked, but revealed to the righteous. Manna was round, speaking of holiness and purity, as was Christ. It was right, speaking of, of uh, righteousness and purity. It, it had the taste of honey, speaking of the glory of God. It had to be sought and, and, and gathered up. It had to be lifted up. And if I, even if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And they had to receive it to themselves. For as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power, the authority to become the children of God. And oh, so, so much more. But for the lack of time, we end here. God, I want to thank you for the joy of going into your word and letting your word be uh, just that beacon that leads us from darkness and through the path of light in the midst of this darkened and perverted world. We love you, Lord, and I thank you that we could come and look together, study together, pray together. I thank you for Terry, Lord, and for her, her sister and her dad. And again, we just bring the covering of prayer to them and ask you, Lord, to just be in the midst of the situation and let them see and know you there. God, we love you. That even in the midst of our storms, you quiet the waters. Lord, in the darkest of hours, you bring the dawn. We love you, Father. And we thank you for your great gift of, of salvation, for the bread that you sent down from heaven that we could be sustained for all of eternity. May you be blessed and honored, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for being there. And we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We have two more days in Esther as we wrap everything up now. We're going to put the bow on it and wrap things up and uh, bring it to a closure. And then next Monday, we will start uh, 
uh, exploring uh, the book of Galatians. May God bless you. I'll see you in the morning, and I pray you have a good and restful evening.